party time on Wall Street as the Dow Jones Industrial Average runs through the 5,000 mark and closes there for the first time ever. Good evening, I'm Paul Kangas in Miami. And I'm Cassie Seifert in New York. There's a publicly traded company caught in the crossfire of the budget battle on Capitol Hill and will take stock of the retail sector as a possible investment option for you. Nightly Business Report is brought to you by Digital Equipment Corporation, engineering networked information systems that help you turn uncertainty into opportunity. Digital, whatever it takes. Franklin and Templeton Worldwide form the more than 125 billion Franklin Templeton Group, a global alliance of mutual funds and investment products distributed by investment professionals. A.G. Edwards, helping today's businesses grow with comprehensive corporate services, investment banking, and business retirement plans designed for their needs. And is produced in association with Reuters, which provides real-time market data and news coverage through a global network of journalists, photographers, and cameramen. The Dow Jones Industrial Average stands tonight at 5,023.55. This is the first time in history the Dow has ever closed above 5,000. Scott Gervey is standing by live at the New York Stock Exchange, where it's now a lot quieter, Scott, than it was just a few hours ago. That's right, Cassie. It was a lot more frenetic here just a couple of hours ago, but it didn't start out that way at the beginning of trading today. In fact, for most of the day, it seemed like 5,000 was just out of the question. While the Dow showed gains early, it stayed under 5,000 throughout the morning. The broader market was weak, and many of the hot Internet stocks over on the NASDAQ were in a sharp correction. That began to change around lunch. The NASDAQ started to recover, and those investors who had taken profits by cutting their high-tech holdings turned to the blue chips. As people take profits in things like tech stocks, they, they want to put them into the big cap safe growth issues. Dow stock Caterpillar was a big winner. It appears to be nearing the end of a 17-month strike and was upgraded today by Smith Barney. IBM, Alcoa, McDonald's, and Coca-Cola also helped send the industrial average past another millennium mark. There was a roar at the closing bell. The Dow had gained more than 40 points to stand at 5,023. It hit 4,000 for the first time just nine months ago. Given the possibility of uh, an agreement on a balanced budget in the near future, which I think would lead uh, Fed Chairman Greenspan to cut rates again, uh, that would fuel things higher. I mean, you. We could see 54, 5,500 in the first few months of 1996. Now, it certainly would be no great surprise here if the market cooled off for the next few days, particularly tomorrow and Friday when uh, trading volume is down because of the holiday. But after that, the mood here is definitely pretty bullish. And more than one trader reminded me today that a presidential election year is usually very good for the markets. Paul? Undaunted by the failure of the Dow Industrial Average to close above the 5,000 mark yesterday, Wall Street's bulls came out uh, on the buy side early today and bid the blue chip Dow up to a nine point gain at 10.30 this morning. But the upturn faded after the recently strong internet stocks took a real tumble on heavy profit taking. At 11.30 this morning, the Industrial Average was up only two points. Another blue chip rally spearheaded by Caterpillar began over the noon hour and by 1.30 p.m. the industrial average was up 28 points at the 5,011 mark. That move was convincing enough to entice more buyers to the party and the Dow Jones industrial average soared to a closing gain of 40.46 points to its first close ever above 5,000 at 5,023.55. The Dow's overall range today 48 and a half points and as you can see it closed right near the high of the day and that was up about 47 and a third points from the lowest level of the session. Trading volume picked up considerably from yesterday to 408.3 million shares and a lot more up volume than down volume. The Dow transports down 6.19, not too bad again. Uh, mostly the airlines uh, were on the weak side. Utilities up nearly a point and the closing tick decidedly bullish at plus 443. Standard & Poor's 500 at a record high, up 3.39. The 100, a record 3.83 gain today. Mid-cap 400 fell nearly a half point, while the Commodity Research Bureau Spot Index was down over a point and a half, rather large drop there. The New York Stock Exchange Composite at a record, up 1.31. The Value Line edging up 0.13. And the Wilshire 5,000 gained just over 14 points, but not at a record. After the market closed, the New York Exchange reported short interest in the month ending November 15th, rose 25.3 million shares, not a big rise. Uh, to a total of 1.99 billion shares in short position now. Over the American exchange, short interest fell 1.6 million shares to a total of 104.9 million. 
In the absence of any major reports on the economy today, the bond market wandered around in a narrow range until mid-session when the Treasury's 10-year note auction came to market with only a lukewarm reception, resulting in a higher-than-expected average yield of 5.90%. Another negative was the Johnson Red Book report showing retail sales were up 2.2% through November's third week compared to October. Although tax-free and corporate issues ended mostly unchanged, the long-term government market lost uh, 8 30 seconds in that 30-year bond, uh, bringing the yield up to 6.27%. Lehman Brothers Long Bond Index was down nearly 4 and 3 quarter points, and Fed funds edged down a bit from yesterday to close at 5 and 5 eighths percent. Later, I'll show you where the action was on Wall Street today. Here with us now to help put this market in some perspective is a man who's seen many century marks crossed in the stock market, Robert Stovall, president of Stovall 21st Advisors. Uh, Bob, the Dow is crossing these milestones faster and faster now. What does that tell you? It tells us that the, the Dow 30 itself is, uh, is not the measurement of the market that it used to be. It's become uh, more and more volatile. Uh, we were, we've up, we're up 1,200 points in the last uh, 12 months, uh, so it's amazing, really. Are you then discounting the, this century mark, the Dow crossing 5,000 today? Oh, it's, it's very important to me. I recall, recomm uh, not recommending, but uh, predicting uh, 5,000 by 2,000 back in the early 80s. So here we are, 5,000 by 1995, and I think the earnings justify where it is, and uh, so does the rest of the economic environment. And it's the average of the index that people all around the world follow. So despite its several imperfections, it is the measurement of the U.S. stock market. And do you think that this is a top in the stock market now, or does the Dow continue to go up from here? I was doing a little plotting and, uh, and figuring today, Cassie, and I think uh, I'd like to be one of the first to say uh, uh, 10,000 by 2,000. All, all you'd have to see is a doubling of corporate earnings over the next five years, and inflation and interest rates behaving themselves, maybe even going down a bit if we do get a balanced budget type legislation underway and the government really does fight to hold down spending growth, I think it could happen. You think it's really r realistic to think that corporate earnings could double in the next five years and the stock market along with them? They could. Uh, they've doubled over the last several years. Of course, we came out of a recession into a long recovery and now these are uh, peak earnings of sorts, so it's be more difficult, but uh, in five years I think it possibly could happen. Well, uh, on top of one very bold prediction, uh, would you like to uh, predict for us which sectors of the market are likely to lead? We're now, uh, I think, uh, coming out of the Federal Reserve Board's induced soft landing, and the growth is only a, going to average about 2.75% in real growth in the states here this year, and the first part of next year about the same. So then we'll look forward to an expansion picking up again later in the year. So we just look to the sectors and the industries that tend to kick in when the uh, economy begins expanding, and that would be first the transportation, such as railroads and airlines, which are already doing pretty well. Those and that are called the early cyclicals. Early cyclicals, and then you move on to the uh, consumer cyclicals, such as uh, housing and appliances and housewares, and after that, uh, automobiles, and, uh, and then capital spending moving along with it. Now, of course, this isn't perfect. We're seeing rallies in the copper stocks today and Caterpillar today, all on special news, and they are consumers, uh, consumer cyclical and also capital spending stocks. All right. Well, I thank you very much for joining us. I hope that uh, your prediction comes true. Let, let's, let's wait for it to happen. <laughs> Our guest, Bob Stovall of Stovall 21st Advisors. Although the Dow reached another milestone today, not every stock group has risen as sharply as that index. Tonight, in Taking Stock, our continuing series of reports on different market segments, we examine the retailers. While sagging sales had hurt those company stocks, they recently began an upward move, which analysts think could continue. Suzanne Pratt reports. Analysts say some of the best bargains this holiday season may be found outside the nation's shopping malls. Retail stocks, which don't usually perform until the economy is coming out of recession, have lately been perking up. Retail stocks right now are an unusually good value because we've had such a drought of bad retail sales for the last, oh, easily four or five quarters uh, that the market has been very punishing towards basically the sector as a group. According to Standard & Poor's, so far this year, its department store index gained 17.5 percent, general merchandise about 15 percent, and specialty apparel about 16 percent. Meanwhile, specialty stores lost 5.5% and the S&P 500 gained about 30%.
Just a few weeks ago, many retail stocks were still tattered until colder weather in the Northeast and Midwest and the impending holiday season started to bring consumers into the stores and investors into the market. Analysts say even though money has already been made, there are still good buys. Analyst Steve Kernkraut likes The Gap, Zales Jewelers, and The Men's Warehouse. These are solid growth stories, and I think that they are, uh, they are solid long-term growth stories, and I think you are seeing a rekindling of interest amongst investors in terms of the retail sector. Analysts also say department stores, which enjoyed a nice run in recent weeks, may have a little strength left. But in general, they say carefully chosen specialty stores are a safer bet. The office supplies superstore companies on a very long-term basis. Also, Barnes & Noble's. I think that's um, a definite winner in the um, retail book superstore industry. There's some others that I think are a little bit pricey right now, but over the longer term, I think are still attractive candidates. Um, Bed Bath & Beyond would be one. Analysts expect this holiday season will be mediocre for retailers, so they recommend that investors buy companies with good long-term prospects, those that are able to boost earnings without strong sales. Suzanne Pratt, Nightly Business Report, New York. Still ahead on Nightly Business Report, the economics of a professional football franchise. With teams changing home cities as fast as they make touchdowns, does NFL now stand for not for long? Shares of Sally May, the Student Loan Marketing Association, closed up two and three quarters today at 66 and a quarter. After a federal judge ruled the government may not charge Sally May a fee on the student loans it uses to back securities. But as Darren Gersh reports, Sally May could still be a hostage to budget year bargaining. As Washington bickers over the budget, there are few companies with a more direct stake in the outcome than Sally May. A publicly traded company chartered by the government to finance student loans, Sally May is caught in the crossfire over one of the president's top priorities, education. I simply cannot sign a budget that devastates Medicare to the elderly or Medicaid that robs educational opportunity or educational standards from our children. The administration believes it can save students money by cutting out Sally May and the banks and lending directly to students. 38% of all student loans this year will be made directly by the government. But Republicans believe the government is less efficient than the private sector, and their balanced budget bill would cut direct lending to 10% of the market. Analysts predict the White House and Congress will compromise, capping direct lending at 20 to 30% of the market. That would leave uh, Sally May with 80% uh, uh, of the market, roughly. Uh, so I think that would be favorable for the company. So far, it's been a favorable year for Sally May shareholders. Yesterday's court ruling that the government may not charge Sally May a fee to securitize student loans could save the company millions. Earlier this year, dissident shareholders forced the company to buy back stock and cut expenses. And with Congress favoring a cap on direct lending, the company's stock has doubled this year. But analysts say it would be difficult for Sally May stock to reach the $70 range it commanded just a few years ago. Analyst Ethan Siegel believes there's already too much good news in the is, stock. Is while the direct lending issue has become a holy grail for a lot of conservative Republicans, their leadership would much rather see a capital gains cut and would much rather see a seven-year budget deal. And so I think direct lending could end up still around 40 percent. And if that's true, uh, that's going to uh, burst the uh, bubble for a lot of investors. Whatever happens on the budget, education and direct lending are likely to be issues in next year's election. And that means politics will continue to play a large role in Sally May's future. Darren Gersh, Nightly Business Report, Washington. Another record smasher for the Dow on Wall Street today. First time ever close above 5,000. And actually, history's on its side for the rest of the week. The market, 70% of the time over the last 30 years or so, has moved higher the day before Thanksgiving and the day after. 
up 40 and a half points today. The broader market just barely higher, about 12 stocks up for every 10 down. 121 new highs for the year, 37 new lows. Micron Technology once again topped the active list today on 10.7 million shares, and it moved up three quarters, stabilizing after breaking uh, technical support over recent sessions. British Petroleum did well, up two full points. Morgan Stanley increased 95 earnings estimates for the company and also upgraded the stock from outperform to a strong buy. Motorola down one and three eighths, and Texas Instruments down a point and a half in that weak high tech sector. Kmart held steady today. Vodafone Group down four and five eighths. Company reported an 11.6 percent increase in six month earnings and boosted the dividend by 20 percent. But uh, Wall Street was disappointed with that uh, earnings uh, statement, and also the company itself forecast a slowdown in new subscribers. Telmex up one and five eighths. Mexican market very strong today. Ford Motor edged an eighth higher. Hewlett Packard no change there. Walmart tenth in volume gained a quarter. Alcoa. A uh, Dow stock. All of these first five on the board are Dow stocks, as you can see by the italicized print. Up two and three quarters on Alcoa. Caterpillar up three and three quarters. Coca-Cola rising one and a half. GM up a point and three eighths, and McDonald's up one and one eighth. These five gains in these five Dow stocks ac accounted for nearly 31 points of the Dow's 40 and a half point advance today. Merrill Lynch dropped two and a quarter points. It appears that Orange County, California, is stepping up its court fight in blaming Merrill Lynch for its bankruptcy. Boston Beer went public today in a heady opening indeed. The stock uh, came public at a price of $20 a share, 3 million shares offered, opened at 32. That was a high of the day. It backed off a little bit. The company has some 14 brands under the Samuel Adams label. Pittston Minerals Group up one and a half matching yesterday's gain when the company said it's come across a rather rich nickel sulfide discovery in Western Australia. And Merrill Lynch today upgraded the stock from neutral to buy. Coal National up one full point. This company sells eyewear products and uh, optometric services around the country. Third quarter turnaround, two cents in earnings versus a loss of five cents a share last year. Reebok International dropping two and a half points after the Smith Barney brokerage downgraded it from neutral to underperform. American stores dropped to point and five eighths. Third quarter earnings lower, 46 cents down from 69 cents last year. And Helene Curtis Industries dropping a point and five eighths. The company sees lower than expected fiscal 96 pre-tax earnings of 20 to 24 million dollars, and also forecast a third quarter loss. NASDAQ trading a loss of nearly four and a half points in the index. Look at that volume, almost 538 million shares. Uh, 14 stocks up for every 21 lower. Not a good day for NASDAQ. Sun Microsystems fell nearly two points, but Microsoft rebounded two points after recent weakness. Cisco down three eighths. Intel up seven eighths. Uh, Bay Networks up a point and three quarters. Applied Materials gained a point. Altera tumbling three and a quarter, mainly because Xilinx dropped two and three quarters after uh, Xilinx was uh, downgraded by Cowan and Company from buy to neutral and Prudential Securities cut earnings estimates on Xilinx. The two companies are in similar businesses. America Online tumbling four and three quarters. And finally, Netscape uh, no longer defying gravity, down eight and a half points on heavy profit taking. Network Appliance went public today. The company makes uh, data storage systems, 2.7 million shares, offered at $13.50, opened at 17 and a quarter. The high was 21 and a quarter. Silicon Storage went public today. This company markets flash memory devices. Five million share IPO offered at nine, opened at 12, traded as high as 14 and three quarters, and then settled back. And finally, UUNet Technologies tumbling 20 and one quarter points, heavy profit taking in the internet stocks. That stock went public last May at $14 a share. The American Exchange Index down three points today. Volume uh, down about three and a quarter million shares. I should say up of three and a quarter million shares from yesterday. And a hundred more issues closed with losses than gains. Emeritus uh, topped the act list and went public today. This company uh, has uh, assisted living communities, 6.5 million shares offered at 15. It opened there, traded as high as 15 and an eighth and settled right at the offering price. PC quote up a full point. Company says its products, which include real-time uh, market quotes uh, and other financial information, are doing well on the internet. And Mediologic down one and a half. The company's chief financial officer told us the stock rose two points last week after it unveiled a new product at the Comdex uh, uh, big show out there in Las Vegas little profit taking he said that's our Wall Street wrap up Cassie this year has been busy for the National Football League's moving companies so far four teams have either moved or planned to move from their present hometowns to new cities as Jeff Yostein reports with the current economic state of the NFL the trend is likely to continue last week the Houston Oilers announced they will move to Nashville by 1998 in doing so Houston joins the former LA Raiders and Rams and the Cleveland Browns in the latest game of franchise musical chairs. Experts blame it on stadium economics. If they don't have stadium revenues in their existing locations, 
in order to provide the fans with the entertainment value that they want, namely a winning team on the field, they are going to have to relocate to a new city to be able to garner and marshal the stadium revenues to be able to put a winning team on the field. Why are stadiums so important these days? NFL teams have a long-standing revenue-sharing agreement. That means network TV revenues, team merchandising sales, and ticket sales are all shared equally among all the league's clubs. The one thing teams do not have to share with the league are stadium revenues. That means money from advertising, concessions, parking, and skybox leases totaling millions of dollars. That means more money in the owners' pockets, more money to hire better players, and an increase in the value of the franchise. Analysts say that's why teams like the Oilers are moving to where they can get a better deal on a stadium. But some say what may be good for the owners is not good for football. It hurts the sport in many different ways. They might be getting new fans, but you, it's kind of like in any business. You want, to get new, you want to get new customers, but you don't want to throw away the existing customers you have and exchange the existing customers. You want to build upon your customer base. Marketers like Laval say the NFL is selling entertainment, with each team having its own brand or image. Moving teams destroys the brand, and over the long run, saps the enthusiasm of fans who realize if it can happen in Houston or Cleveland, it could happen to their team, too. Jeff Yastine, Nightly Business Report, Miami. Coming up in tonight's commentary, Carla Anderson Hills and last week's APEC Summit in Osaka. The European Commission today sharply criticized an ad campaign by Philip Morris that calls for greater consideration of smokers' rights. The EU said the ads do not acknowledge the damage secondhand smoke can do to non-smokers. The criticism comes the week before EU health commissioners will meet to consider a proposed ban on tobacco advertising. Philip Morris officials were not available for comment. Truth in advertising apparently holds true in cyberspace. The Transportation Department today fined Virgin Atlantic Airways $14,000 for posting a misleading ad on the Internet. A civil penalty was assessed for an ad listing a fare for flights from Newark, New Jersey to London, and that fare was not available. Besides paying the fine, Virgin agreed to refrain from such ads in the future. In tonight's commentary, former trade ambassador Carla Anderson Hills, chairman of Hills & Company, has some thoughts on the recent APEC meeting in Japan and what it accomplished. Last Sunday in Japan, leaders of the 18 Asia-Pacific economies wound up their third summit, held to draft a blueprint for fraying trade and investment in the region over the next 25 years. The results were disappointing. Some leaders insisted on protections for particular sectors. Others pushed to postpone the time frame for liberalization, agreed to only last year. When asked to set forth the market opening measures they would undertake near term, most leaders summarized actions they had already taken. Sadly, the United States did no better than the rest. Our nation took an atypical backseat role at this summit, largely because President Clinton has been unable to persuade Congress to give him the legislative authority to negotiate in the trade arena, and he has shown little enthusiasm to tackle significant trade initiatives before the elections. The President's last-minute cancellation to attend the summit compounded the perception that the United States has abandoned his traditional leadership for economic liberalization in the region. Our interest in opening the Asia-Pacific economy stems from far more than an ideological commitment to free trade. It concerns the future economic health of our nation. Sixty percent of our merchandise exports goes to the Pacific Rim, and our sales there are growing four times faster than their sales to us. Yet as our economic stake is rising in the region, our influence is waning. Our national interest compels us to demonstrate real leadership to expand opportunities in this dynamic region. That was sorely lacking this past weekend. I'm Carla Anderson-Hills. 
And that's Nightly Business Report for Tuesday, November 21st. I'm Cassie Seifert in New York. Good night, Paul. Good night, Cassie. I'm Paul Kangas in Miami, wishing all of you the best of goodbyes. Nightly Business Report is produced in association with Reuters, which provides real-time market data and news coverage through a global network of journalists, photographers, and cameramen. And is made possible by A.G. Edwards, helping today's businesses grow with comprehensive corporate services, investment banking, and business retirement plans designed for their needs. The Franklin Templeton Group is a global alliance of over 110 mutual funds and investment products, including tax-free income funds, domestic and international growth funds, and money market funds. Digital Equipment Corporation, engineering networked information systems that help you turn uncertainty into opportunity. Digital, whatever it takes. And by the financial support of viewers like you. Nightly Business Report is made possible in part by the Jefferson State Bank and the Joseph and Bessie Feinberg Foundation.